All right, I'm here with Dr. Josh Levitt. He is a naturopathic physician. He's also the founder of Up Wellness and an expert in pain management. Dr. Josh, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. Look forward to it. Yep. Absolutely. I, I'm super excited to uh, jam out with you. Uh, I only like to yeah. rock out with high vibe people. And from what I've gotten to see from you, that is that is what you do. Um, you know, you're a naturopathic physician and I've had a couple naturopaths on it, but I'm, I'm curious for you, you know, you kind of know my philosophy with the Western approach and, uh, you know, that was really actually how I, I'm not a naturopath. I'm a holistic health coach. And, but that is how I kind of went down my own path for uh, holistic health or medicine, whatever you want to call it. Because I wasn't getting results from the Western, um, the Western side, more or less, and I wanted to start understanding more about root causes and like how do we really get to it? I want to put a bandaid on things. So, but I'm just curious for you, like how did how did you get started on this? Was there a day you realized, like for same thing for you, was there a day you realized, like that's it, like this is what I want to do with my life? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And we, we all have our personal stories, right? Um, and there was a day um, I, I can kind of pin it down. Um, so let me give you a little background before we get to that particular day. So I, I grew up in Southern California, a surfer and a skater, and I was I come from a family of doctors. Um, I always wanted to be a doctor. I was like one of those kids who just always wanted to be a doctor. Um, I went to UCLA on a pre-med track. I studied neurophysiology there. My dad at the time was training medical residents uh, at, at UCLA. Um, so I had kind of, I don't know, backstage access to doctors, you might call it. Um, and, and then this is like in my early 20s, I'm in my late 40s now, um, they were telling me that medicine was changing for the worse, right? These docs were all like, basically don't do it. You know, it was kind of what they were saying. And so it was like, well, what am I going to do? I kind of always wanted to be a doctor. Anyway, I had the good fortune to be able to take a, a year long trip. So I, I went, I got a backpack, you know, some hiking boots. And I went really on a walkabout around the world, all over the place, sleeping on beaches, hitchhiking, staying in youth hostels, all that sort of stuff. At one point, I got a blister on the back of my foot from some sandals that I had bought, and um, it turned into cellulitis. And cellulitis is a, is a bad thing, right? It was, it was creeping up my leg. At this time, when it was really advancing up my leg, I had a fever. It was really bad, and I was en route in an airplane uh, headed towards Zurich, Switzerland. So I landed in Switzerland and I had severe cellulitis with a fever. It was really bad. I called home. I got a prescription for antibiotics called into this pharmacy in Zurich where I went in and I was kind of tripped out because I was, you know, had a high fever and I was, my mind was playing tricks on me. Um, and I picked up these antibiotics which helped me. They cured my infection, saved my leg, maybe even saved my life. So that's part A. But part B, in contrast to anything I had ever known in Southern California, which is where my life was, I saw in this pharmacy, not only the antibiotics that I needed at the time, but also this whole world, right, of like herbal stuff, homeopathic stuff, tea and like natural things. And I was tripped out. Like I was like, wow, you know, I was probably also like a little febrile, you know, but like this was amazing to me. Like there's medicine that's not just like medicine that like this antibiotic. And I and I was also in a journey of discovery at that time in my life anyway. And that just basically ignited a spark that became the passion that's basically led my, my entire career. And so I, I now, you know, still have that passion for and enthusiasm for natural medicine. And I guess it's, it's sort of, I, I, there's some irony there because like I'm the naturopathic doctor who got his start in naturopathic medicine on the day that I needed antibiotics. Right. So it's like, like, and by the way, I'm no fan of antibiotics. Like I think they're grossly overused. I think they're used for too long. I think they're used inappropriately all the time on humans and on livestock. So like, uh, you know, but I think they're also great and necessary when they're necessary as they were in my case, um, in that particular case. But, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's my story. The, uh, the origin story, if you will. And here I am now kind of like, you know, on what I see as a bridge that's still in construction between Western medicine, mainstream conventional medicine and alternative medicine. And when I got started and even before that, those worlds were just totally far apart from each other. Never the two shall meet. And I think as I've moved through my career, it's not just been me, but lots of people kind of trying to construct that bridge and bring the best of both worlds closer together. That's, that's, that's what I'm about. 
I, I love that. Yeah, and I mean, you're right. There's that duality, and so you, you can't you can't have one with the other. We have to we have to find a way to work and coexist in in a harmonious way. And I think that's the only way. And I agree. You know, I mean, listen, if I got MRSA or something on my leg, uh, don't get me wrong, I would definitely try my tea tree oil and all that stuff. But if that ain't working, uh, yeah, I might have to pop a couple antibiotics. But it wouldn't be my it wouldn't be my first to uh, first go to. Nor mine. Excited. It would not be my first choice either. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned this excitement that you still have. Like, what's exciting you right now? Are, are there herbs or or is there a new, like, or, you know, everyone's talking about peptides in the natural you know, functional medicine world or, you know, what's exciting you right now? Um, that's a great question. I get excited by lots of things. Um, I think one of the things that's really high on my list that I don't think gets enough attention in the mainstream media, um, is adaptogenic herbal medicines, adaptogens. Um, and there's a whole family of them and it's not a, not a botanical family per se in the, in the, in the, in the, botanical sense, but, um, a family of, uh, of herbs that are used to help people adapt better to adverse environmental conditions. So, you know, herbs like rhodiola, ashwagandha, eleutherococcus, and then probably especially exciting is, um, is medicinal mushrooms, which are having their moment in the sun right now. Um, I use them all the time in clinical practice. I formulate with them in our products, lion's mane, turkey tail, shiitake, reishi, cordyceps, uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, those excite me a lot and 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 the the ever growing body of scientific literature that supports their use that we've long known in history have been so useful is now being validated by science that stuff juices me up okay dr josh talk about that because you know um I know a lot about, and I've heard a lot about adaptogens and things like ashwagandha and some of the rhodiola, some of these things that you're talking about to help yeah. our bodies become more adaptive, like you said, adaptogenic, and, and, and especially yeah. I think of just stress. And we are right now at a very stressful point in, in history, and when you look yeah. at the infertility rates, men's testosterone going down, we're seeing an absolute epidemic or pandemic, whatever you want to call it. And uh, so, yeah, tell me more about this and what you're seeing. Are you using that in your practice? Are you seeing like – because I think a lot of people go, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, herbs, yeah, I've heard about these Chinese herbs. They're, they're okay, but they're not strong enough maybe, at least in their head. They're thinking, this is not strong enough than maybe – um, yeah. Just get, just give me the TRT, Doctor Doctor Josh. Like I don't I don't need all this. It's like uh, no, we can right. probably actually get your body recalibrated with just some simple adaptogens. So yeah, talk about that and just kind of what you're noticing with some of your clients. Totally, and I, that's a great question. And there's a lot to say here. So first of all, I think it's been part of the reason why adaptogens are so intriguing to me and, and to talk about on a platform like this with you is that I think people don't understand the power that they have because when we talk about stress. Stress that in, in so many people's lives comes from their boss, their husband, their wife, their kids, their money problems, whatever the case may be, right? And it's hard for people to connect or believe that like an herbal medicine can help them because their problem is that they need to get rid of that husband or get rid of that boss or get rid of that job or win the lottery or something like that. So it's hard for people to connect that like, oh, an herbal medicine, it may be great stuff, but it's not going to like get me a new job or get me more money or cure my stress. And no one's, not me anyway, is suggesting that it can do that. What it can do, though, is help you better respond or adapt to the stresses that are in your life so that those stresses don't incapacitate you so much in your mind, in your brain, in your gut, in your musculoskeletal system, where in your sleep, wherever the case may be. And, and that's where adaptogens are fascinating. So I, I think... Let me tell you a story. It's not so much a story as just a really interesting ethnobotanical fascination which is that adaptogenic plants tend to grow in difficult environmental conditions. So take, we mentioned rhodiola, for example, or eleutherococcus, Siberian ginseng. These plants grow in extremely cold temperatures, like in Arctic tundra, right? Here, I live in Connecticut. Even here, you have plants that come up out of the, out of the winter, you know, daffodils blooming now in the springtime. And it's amazing to see a plant that's so hardy, right, that can can survive despite really extreme adverse environmental conditions. So adaptogens are known for growing and thriving in adverse or extreme environmental conditions, be it cold, dryness, extreme moisture, extreme altitude, like maca grows high up in the Peruvian Andes. So extreme altitude, that's not an easy thing to grow in, right? There's oxygen levels are lower, et cetera. 
How do plants do that? Well, if plants are cold, they can't like go get a sweater, right? Like they can't move, right? So they have to survive and evolve to survive using chemistry. That's how, that's how plants do it. So the reason why maca can grow in those high altitudes or rhodiola can grow in that extreme cold is because of chemistry. They have chemicals inside of them that allow them to thrive in these adverse, stressful environmental conditions. And, and this is where it gets cosmically cool, is that those same chemicals that allow the plants to survive or even thrive in adverse environmental conditions, when we consume those chemicals like salidricides in, in rhodiola or other kinds of compounds in these other adaptogens, they impact our biochemistry of our adrenal glands and our hypothalamic pituitary axis and all that stuff and help us thrive and survive in adverse environmental conditions. Now, it may not be altitude or extreme cold, but it could be a difficult boss, not enough money, challenging work environment, challenging children, whatever the case may be. So that's why adaptogens are so awesome. And they are. They're just they're, they're awesome medicines, no doubt about it. Do you like, because you mentioned, uh, you know, you mentioned mushrooms, the medicinal mushrooms, reishi, shiitake, yeah. uh, chaga, lion's mane. And, you know, have do you like, do you gravitate to more of those or some of those the Chinese herbal roots? I'm going to refer to them as Chinese, although I don't think that's incorrect. When I'm speaking of like ashwagandha, eleuthero, yeah. rhodiola, yeah. Um, or do you just like do you like them both? Do you like them just to kind of – what have you seen most successful, I guess, with, with clients and, and just in, in terms of stress and cortisol and all that? Yeah, yeah. Stuff? It's another great question. So there, I think each of these plants, including the mushrooms, which, which are not exactly plants, but we'll put that in the broad category, they each have um, – uh, herbalists might describe them as a, as a unique personality or like a penchant to target a certain thing, right? So lion's mane, for example, is particular um, a value in, in, in the nourishment um, and healing of the brain and cognition. So you see lion's mane used a lot for brain-related things. Um, rhodiola, especially for energy. Ashwagandha for stress and, and, and libido and hormonal function. So each one has a distinct personality, but it, that, I think to, to take those herbal medicines and pigeonhole them and say lion's mane is good for brains, turkey tail is good for immunity, rhodiola is good for this, maca is good for that, is not really fair to the plants um, because they all have broader effects than that. And of course, like that's doing a Western reductionism on what these plants are for and the way that we use medicines for this and medicines for that. Plants don't work like that. They work, herbal medicines work on people or like on people who have organs or specific problems. Um, and historically, to get more straight to the meat of your question, these these plants and mushrooms have often historically been used as formulas, right? More complex formulas. It's not monotherapy in that way. So generally speaking, in my patient population and in the products that I formulate for Up Wellness, I use them in um, in a broader context, so like as a family. So just as an example, one, one of the big products that I, that I love so much that I drink every day myself is called Mojo, which helps you get your mojo back, right? Whatever mojo means. It means different things, different people. Um, and it has a blend of many of the things that we just mentioned, rhodiola, eleuthero, ashwagandha, and a whole series of medicinal mushrooms. So I tend to favor them in formulations, complex formulations. I love that. I know my mentor and naturopath said the same thing. These things work in synergies and like I said, the monotherapy, he said he's never seen work really well and, and using the synergy to create, um, I love how you refer to the organism. It's like this DNA and I think we are, we forget that, that we are this living organism and so are these plants and, 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 and collectively uh, they come together and they, they work in this harmony. Uh, that, that's really amazing. Really quick too, I wanted to ask you, uh, testing because I know testing on these, there's a lot of heavy metals, there's a lot of pesticides and all that how important is that for you at up wellness and and, and getting that more mojo back yeah well it's of critical importance um yes the herbal medicine industry all the way from the fields right to the shelf um or from the seeds to the shelf so to speak um there's all kinds of opportunities for fraud tampering bad quality products etc and um yeah we could do episode upon episode about all the the supply chain related issues um yeah good quality which means purity it means potency it means um the testing for uh common uh 
contaminants that might be there, which is the contaminants that might exist in the soil or that which may have been sprayed on the plants, et cetera, is, is of paramount importance. And um, we're very rigorous uh, about that when we, uh, when we source raw materials and manufacture products. Awesome. Good to know. Um, I wanted to ask you, obviously, one of the things that people really know you about is pain and pain management. And I'm just curious, what are people getting wrong when it comes to this understanding of pain? Or what do you think that people are, are misunderstanding? Because we hear this all the time. I got arthritis. I hear this all the time. I got arthritis, Joel. And, uh, you know, they make it seem like it's a death sentence. And, or, and I'm just like, like, this is easily fixable, actually, believe it or not. So what are some of the things that you see that are very common that people are getting wrong when it comes to pain? Yeah, yeah, totally. That's a, a, a great question. So you're right. When people get a diagnosis, right, like of, of arthritis or of a meniscus tear or a bulging disc or a herniated disc in their neck or back, in Western medicine, what happens is the diagnosis gets made, right? It's arthritis, it's a meniscus tear, whatever. And then the thinking stops, right? And what we then go to is just a menu of options that usually looks like uh, anti-inflammatory medications, either over-the-counter ones or prescription ones, and then injectable medications, and then uh, maybe even surgical interventions, arthroscopy or total joint replacement, right? So it's like there's a diagnosis, and then the thinking stops, and we just go to the menu to 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 pick the items that are that are next in line. In naturopathic medicine, the way I see it is when when a diagnosis gets made, you know that's when the thinking ought to begin. Like, okay, you have arthritis. Okay, you have a disc herniation, but if you have pain. We need to ask some real questions, which is why. And so to, to your specific question, what are people getting wrong? One of the big things that we're getting wrong is, is what I call attribution, misattribution or attribution error, where when we see something like arthritis on an image or a meniscus tear on an MRI or a bulging disc on an MRI scan of the back or neck, we immediately, in a person who has pain, right? So the person has pain and then we see something that's wrong on an image, what immediately happens in the minds of patients and in doctors is that the that which we saw that was abnormal uh, the abnormality on the image is believed to be the cause of the pain right it's like oh you have back pain and you have a disc herniation those two things must be related to each other the back pain is caused by the disc herniation and the truth is and this is not a naturopathic or alternative medicine truth this is just a truth that it's not the case that's not true lumbar disc herniations often exist in people who have no pain. Meniscus tears frequently exist in people who have no pain. Arthritis, extremely common in people who have no pain. So that's a, a huge rift, right? And so when we st then we have to start asking the question, all right, you have pain and you have some arthritis. You have pain and you have a meniscus tear. You have pain and you have a lumbar disc herniation. Why do you have the pain? You know, maybe the disc herniation is part of it, but there's more to that story. And that is where... I think that's one of the defining moments of my career is sort of like, is like honing in on what that is that actually is the source of the pain. Forget about the imaging. I love that. I love that. Uh, you know, one of the things I've learned too over the time is that pain is usually a source or when you start getting the signal from the brain that you're receiving this pain, it's really a brain issue. Uh, the brain is, I mean, doing something to protect you. And sometimes the yeah. brain can get in these really interesting neurofeedback loops and keep you there for a long period of time, even though your body has healed. And so yeah. um, it's fascinating. And, and I think the more people really start to dive into the root cause of how did this pain, I mean, obviously we know, if, again, if I jump off the roof of my house, I'm, I'm, that makes sense if I break something, I'm out of pain. But we're talking about this kind of chronic pain that is occurring with the arthritis or anything like that. So um, really interesting. And yeah. even acute pain. I mean, can I tell you a story real quick that I think Please. illustrates this really well? One, one, one time I was, I was training medical residents at the time and we had x-ray facilities on site. So th this lady comes in in a, in a wheelchair. She, she was an 80 plus year old woman. She was brought in, wheeled in by her daughter. And this woman was in excruciating pain in her neck. And uh, the daughter and, and her, we talked uh, before we brought her in and she said that she had been in this pain for three days. So terrible pain. I mean, disabling. She couldn't walk or anything. And so I was concerned that maybe she had a fracture. She was an older lady. Maybe she had osteoporosis, something like that. So we did an x-ray right there on site. And on the x-ray, we saw me and the radiologist and this 
crew of medical students that were behind me, we saw severe cervical disc disease, right? Like late stage advanced arthritis. The vertebrae all collapsed upon each other, you know, it looked like a mess in there. And the radiologist pointed this out and we looked at it. Oh yeah, that, that, that neck does look terrible on x-rays. No question about it. Um, and what he did was exactly what I just described, which was like, okay, there you have it. There's your answer. But she didn't have a fracture, which was good news. And I respectfully disagreed. And I said, listen to the students, I just talked to this woman and she told me that her neck's been hurting for three days, right? She's like 85 years old. This neck has looked this bad for three weeks, for three months, for three years. It's looked terrible for a long time, but her neck's only been hurting for three days. So there's no possible way that what we're seeing on that x-ray just wasn't there four days ago, right? Like it, it had to be there. Why didn't her neck hurt four days ago or five days ago or two weeks ago? And that's because there's more to the story than what we're seeing on that x-ray. And the more to the story was some amount of uh, uh, acute amount of inflammation or excessive inflammation, muscle tension, and one of those neurofeedback loops that you're talking about, an acute spasmodic state, um, and probably some amount of fibrosis, soft tissue scarification from that long-term chronic disc disease. You resolve those other underlying problems. She goes back to having a neck that looks terrible, but feeling okay. And that's exactly what happened in this lady. So anyway, that's just an, an illustration of the point. So good. Okay, so for someone like her, she comes into you, Dr. Josh, I've got all this pain. These guys want to do surgery. You're kind of after, you know, you're kind of reverse engineering the pain like you just said. You're like, well, you probably needed surgery. Based on this MRI, you probably needed surgery mm -hmm. like five years ago, lady. So, mm -hmm. I mean, as long, her biggest issue is pain. So let's just get yeah. you out of the pain loop and you, you don't even need the surgery. You just keep going on. What would you, would there be supplements that you would recommend or were there supplements um, that, and I know you have some really cool supplements um, such as uh, the, the turmeric one, Revive, I believe it's called. Um, yeah. and, and I know you've gotten a lot of good results with that. Was that like something that you would uh, program in her or like, what are some of the best pain relieving tips, I guess? Yeah. So it, it, it's a great question. And so when, when a person's like that, right, this is a person who's in agony, right? And so it, it, I think the goal of the physician, any physician, certainly me, but it should be, I don't think this should be an alternative perspective necessarily, is, is really two things. Number one, to relieve their suffering, right? And so, because that's part of the mission of a doctor, right? Like you, you got to gotta help the person out. And there's any number of different things. And I'm open to all options of, of, of helping a person relieve their suffering immediately. But if we, and, and we can do that with, there's herbal medicine medicines that can do that. There's body work techniques that can do that. There's alternative medicines like, uh, like acupuncture that can be helpful there. You know, so in, in, in her particular case, it was a combination of body work and acupuncture actually delivered at that, at that clinic that helped minimize some of the acute symptoms that she had hands-on body work techniques and herbal medicines, and even some medications that could be useful for the acute situation that she was in. So that was a, the package of the relief suffering piece. And then the other piece is, how did you get here and what can we do to help not once we help this, you know, subside, what can we do to keep it that way? And that goes to those chronic, more longer lasting things, including dietary interventions, including movement based therapies, including stress reduction based therapies, lifestyle interventions, postural, biomechanical strength training, et cetera. Um, and then, yeah, the judicious use of herbal medicine. So yeah, I, I'm an herbal medicine expert and I use a lot of them, um, in my practice, you mentioned uh, Golden Revive Plus. That's that's the flagship product that Up Wellness makes, and the reason why it works so well is because it addresses those underlying causes in in, in a lady like that. And so, yeah, we can talk more about that um, and the specific ingredients if if you want to. Yeah, I wanted to ask you: Is there like, and I know this is a tough question to ask you because I think you you would say, well, Joel, it depends, and everyone's bio individuality and. I would customize it per person, which I totally respect and get. But if I had to pigeon you to like, hey, man, what are your top five like pain relieving supplements or or maybe there's six or maybe there's 10, but just kind of break that down for yeah. us and, and how you and, and why maybe just briefly why you would these would be kind of the top five. Totally. I appreciate the way you asked that, too, because it, it's been a struggle that I've had. It's not maybe so much a struggle, but it is a challenge. And, and that, that's the challenge of seeing one patient one at a time right? Like I do in clinical practice, there's the opportunity to individualize based on their own history, based on their own pain patterns, their own sensitivities, their own tastes, likes, dislikes. When you're creating formulas for a population, like we do at Up Wellness, 
there's not an individual in there. You're trying to find the top hits that are going to be the most useful for the most people. And that's a very different thing. It's very different in the same way that medicine has like, you know, direct primary care versus public health. Public health takes care of populations of people. And sometimes the interest of the population is different than the interest of the individual within that population. So that is a challenge. And I appreciate you. It's, it's, it's rare for someone, um, to understand that difference. So, um, I appreciate that question. So when I formulate a product for musculoskeletal pain, um, like I did with golden revive plus, I pick the big hits, right? The ones that are most useful, safest, and most effective for the most people. So what are they? I'll tell you. Number one, curcumin, which is the active ingredient in turmeric. Turmeric only contains 2% of curcumin by weight, but when you concentrate that curcumin up to 95%, like we do in in Golden Revive Plus with an extract that's called BCM95, um, it is... uh, has powerful action against all of the key players in the biochemical process of inflammation. So curcumin, number one, concentrated at 95%. That BCM-95, uh, I believe that's kind of like the gold standard to when, like, from what I understand, right? When It, comes it to is. It's, it's the most yeah. clinically effective. It's the most well-researched. Um, yeah, and it's a proprietary, highly potent, pure, concentrated turmeric extract. You're absolutely right about that. And that's, that's why... That's why I used it. Um, number two is Boswellia, which also has anti-inflammatory properties. And Boswellia is frankincense. A lot of people know it as frankincense, the uh, the biblical herbal medicine. Um, and it also addresses infl- excessive inflammatory responses. And there's some research showing that it improves the integrity or the surface integrity of cartilage, which is so often pitted, worn, and torn uh, in p- people with musculoskeletal pain. So Boswellia is number two. Um, number three is quercetin. Quercetin is a bioflavonoid compound that is um, found in, it, widely in the su- food supply. It's concentrated in onions. It's a yellow pigment, yellow powder, and it directly inactivates a number of different inflammatory chemicals, and it's a powerful antioxidant as well. So NF-kappa B, cyclooxygenase, which are mediators of inflammation, quercetin suppresses those, which is why it works well for inflammatory pain. Number four is bromelain. Bromelain is an unusual one. It's an extract that comes from pineapples and um, it's in the core and the stem of pineapple. And bromelain is anti-fibrotic. It's a, it's a digestive enzyme, actually. It's a proteolytic enzyme. It breaks up fibrin and fibrin is what scar tissue is made out of. And bromelain, interestingly, I don't know if you know this, it, it's, it's also the active ingredient in meat tenderizer. So like mm. if you sprinkle meat tenderizer on like a tough piece of steak or something, um, you're sprinkling bromelain on there. And what it does is it chemically digests the gristle, the, the toughness, the fibrin. And it does that same thing in our body. So when you eat bromelain or take it as a, as a capsule, it gets absorbed intact. That's been shown. And it has antifibrotic activity in our body. So bromelain, really useful for people with old injuries, really useful for people with stiffness, especially if they had those old injuries and a key component for musculoskeletal pain. Um, Dr. Josh, can I interrupt you real yo, quick? So on the, yeah. this is a selfish question for, for yeah. that. If I'm using bromelain one, um, I, let's say I, like right now I have a kind of a gritty ankle as of the way I would describe it. it just feels a little gritty. Yeah. Um, and I know there's, there's some whole biomechanical issues there and that's causing the downstream effect. But, um, would I two two questions for you with bromelain? I've heard from digestive yeah. enzymes when you want that effect from bromelain, it would be, or not bromelain, but just digestive enzymes, but in general, have it on an empty stomach. Um, would Do you kind of concur with that? If there's someone like me who's got some of this grittiness, take the bromelain. And my second question would be, hey, that's great. However much you put in, like you said, in that formula, I know it's probably for the general population, but I'm assuming for me, I might have to do high dosage, at least temporarily. Uh, what's your thoughts or would I, you know, ante up the dose or what are you thinking? Great questions, both of them. So the you're right about the away from meals effect, um, although it's not as critical as it may seem. So bromelain is proteolytic. It's, it breaks up protein. So if you put bromelain in your stomach with protein, I imagine you're a guy who eats probably a fair amount of protein, um, it will act upon that protein uh, as well, right? So you're going to use up some of the biological activity of the bromelain on the food that you eat. So generally speaking, if you're looking for a systemic effect of proteolytic enzymes like bromelain, there are others as well, you take it away from food so it gets absorbed so it doesn't work on your food, but it works on your ankle, right? That's the idea. Um, th- If you take it with a lower protein meal or a protein that doesn't contain a lot of fibrin, which is the target for bromelain, it's okay. It still gets absorbed intact, but you won't get as much potency. 
Some people also get stomach irritation from bromelain. That's pretty rare, but it, when, if that happens, eating it with food can help a little bit to attenuate or decrease that. So yes, in a perfect world, bromelain on an empty stomach, um, but it's not a perfect world. So we do the best we can. And also a lot of people just forget to take it. So like they, you know, you have a complex dosage schedule like that and then they just don't do it at all. So I don't like to split hairs and make things too terribly complicated. If you must take it with food, especially if it's bromelain and complex with other things, um, taking it with food is okay too. And it works very well that way as well. Um, okay. In terms of dosage. Yeah, you're right. Like the, the amounts that I put into formulations are the amounts that fit into a capsule for a particular person for a broad population because I'm treating that way. Um, in your particular case, if you have a particularly gritty ankle or you really want to push the bromelain, certainly you could take bromelain alone um, and you could push the dose much higher than, than, than you would be able to achieve in a, in a formula with other things. Awesome. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, sorry, and I cut you off. I don't know. Were there any more um, ingredients? That yeah, there was, kind of the top I, five? We, I think we were on, we did, we did curcumin, yeah, five. we did yeah. Boswellia, we did bromelain, we did quercetin. That's four. So there's two more that I would say. Um, I would, I have to put magnesium on the list and magnesium is a mineral um, uh, uh, that's so commonly depleted in the diets of the average person um, because number one, they don't eat enough of it the foods that contain it. And number two, the soils are depleted of magnesium. And that's an unfortunate agricultural problem that we have. Um, and so if the magnesium is not in the soil, then it's not in our food supply. Um, and so magnesium deficiency is a big reason why muscles will overreact and become, you mentioned those neurofeedback group loops, like someone gets in a car accident, they bump their neck, they have a whiplash injury, and then they stay, t you know, the injury heals, but the muscle tension persists magnesium is a key player in that, in a pathway like that. So when people have enough magnesium on board, once the injury heals, things chill back out, relax, go back to normal. If they're magnesium deficient, like so many people are, they might have a whiplash injury, heal from the injury and the muscles stay tight for weeks, months, years, or even decades. So magnesium is really, really important for people with musculoskeletal pain. And that's why I put it in Golden Revive Plus as well. And then the last thing, uh, and this one's a weird one, um, is is an ingredient that comes from black pepper that's called piperine. And piperine is not actually useful for musculoskeletal pain itself, other than the reason why it's there is because it enhances the absorption of all of the other things I just mentioned. So there's a, some really interesting studies. It's probably why black pepper is such a common, maybe the most popular culinary spice in the world. It enhances the flavors of other things, and it also enhances the absorptions of things. So curcumin, our turmeric ingredient, isn't terribly well absorbed, but when you put piperine in the stomach with it, it's absorbed massively uh, greater proportions. So yeah, that's my, that's my top six. Love that. Love it. That's, those yeah. are all heavy hitters. So it's really amazing stuff. Um, you know, I'm curious as a a pain uh, specialist, I mean, you're so much more than that, but just someone who does specialize in pain, what do you think is like the modern day version of cigarettes? Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, it's got to, there's a few. <laughs> yeah. The, the big Go one ahead, that, get, that, yeah. that gets a lot of press <laughs> is, um, is sitting just inactivity. I think like inactivity and not just inactivity, but the, the, I, I guess, it's it, yes, sitting is a problem. And I think, you know, I'm not blowing anybody's mind by saying that sitting is the new smoking. In fact, that's been, that's been written about a lot. We need to move our bodies more, but maybe the, the nuance thing is, is these things, right? These phones, oh, because boy. the posture plague, right? The, the, the head forward posture, the shoulders forward posture. This is something really interesting. I think your listeners will appreciate this. When, when humans focus our eyes on something like I'm focused on a screen right now, the, and we all focus on screens so often in our days. When we focus our eyes on something intensely, like we do on a screen, we engage this old evolutionary reflex where our heads go forward, our shoulders go forward as if we're going to pounce, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really actually, it's, if you look at somebody on a screen of any sort, you'll see them. And if you look at them, it almost looks like they're about like a cat about to pounce on, a, on, a, on, a, on prey, you know? And that's an evolutionary reflex. When you, when your eyes fix, your brain's like, oh, I must be hunting, you know? And so like, I'm going to lurch at the screen, right? And the, it's a great thing, but when it's used in the context of evolutionary hunting, it lasts for just a few minutes at a time. But when you're holding your phone in front of your face and staring at it in that kind of like hunter's posture that, you know, with the head forward, the shoulders forward, 
it just plays hell on your cervical spine, on your shoulder musculature, and it's a nightmare. And I, I'm, I'm actually really concerned that we are going to see, I mentioned this 80-something-year-old woman with the neck pain. I'm, I'm really concerned that our younger generations who've grown up with their heads forward like this are going to create a new uh, epidemic of cervical disc disease um, because the forward head posture is just so terribly dangerous. And I think these kids are going to be in their 20s or 30s by the time their hands are going numb and, um, and their necks are shot. So that, that, that's a scary thing to me. Wow, that is that is amazing. I, obviously, you know, I think of just the musculoskeletal um, pain that people are going to receive. Obviously, from this forward hip tilt position, and they say something like, "If it's just a one degree off or one degree forward, it's like ten pounds extra weight of your head being in this kyphotic yeah. kind of hunched over state." So, yep. but I never heard anybody explain it the way you did. Of just, I'm thinking even what, I can't believe what you just said. The whole stress response by just being in this forward posture, we might be putting ourselves in a more of a fight. Or flight state, which we already, most of us already are stressed out. So yeah, how amazing right. to have that correlation. And just by maybe getting our heads back a little bit, we could be maybe less stressed. So that yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It is. It, it's, it's true. You, you, the, the biomechanics of that. Yeah. And the stress is another whole layer. It's like you hold a bowling ball, if you hold it like your head weighs like 12 pounds, you know, some maybe more than others, but like, you know, if you hold a 12 pound bowling ball, which is pretty common size right next to you, it's not that heavy. You can hold that, right? With your three fingers in the holes there. But if you hold that thing out in front of you, right? Like, you know, that that gets really heavy really quick. And that's exactly what you're talking about. When that head comes forward, it starts getting increasingly heavy. You know, the forces that are applied to the cervical spine are increasingly intense. And the spine's just simply not built for that. It's just not built for that. And I, I shudder at what's going to happen to the necks of, uh, of, of the screen generation. Real quick question. I was just thinking about your supplement company, and you've got a huge line of stuff other than Revive. And I, I don't want to pump up your, your supplement. This is not to pump up your supplement company. But I, I'm curious, what else would you recommend? Is is there something for you that's kind of a non-negotiable in supplements? Like Rev, Revive obviously is, hits a lot of points. But um, like I don't know. Is there a multivitamin that you kind of feel like this in general is probably a good idea. Like people should be taking this. What what are what's kind of like your supplement routine? Just out of yeah, sure. I'm I'm happy to talk about what what we have there. Again, it's it's not for the purposes of promotion, but just sort of like the products that we make are intended to help the most people with the, with the common problems. It it they're outgrowths of my own clinical practice. So there's there's a few things, um, and I think non negotiable might mean different things to different people. For me, non negotiable is is the adaptogens. Right. We we mm -hmm. talked about those earlier. That's that, and we have a product that's called Mojo. I, I drink it every day. Uh, and Mojo contains this, this, this family of adaptogenic herbs. And I find it really useful. I'm a busy guy who has a lot on my plate, um, both personally and professionally. And I just find that that combination just keeps my battery charged in the way that I, in the way that I want it, it keeps, you know, keeps my, my operating system <laughs> functioning well. So that's kind of a non-negotiable and yeah, for, golden revive for the musculoskeletal pain piece and the inflammation piece is really important for other people. It's digestive, you know, so lots of people have, when they have a lot of stress, which we all do, it affects their digestion. I happen to be, I'm grateful that my digestion works pretty well, but for some people, a digestive enzyme product like uh, total revive plus is, is, is a product that we make contains a whole broad spectrum of digestive enzymes and adaptogenic herbs. I put those in there as well to help deal with the stress part is really useful. Probiotics. I know you've talked about the microbiome a lot before and the GI microbiome also with adaptogenic herbs because stress impacts the uh, balance and diversity of the microbiome. Very important as well. Um, and yeah, I could go on and on. Um, we have a, yeah, th those are the, the, the big hits. And so he, I, 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 I what, Yep. One thing I was going to say is you mentioned multivitamins. So I, I, I'm quite convinced that people ought to be getting their baseline nutrition, vitamins, minerals, amino acids from their food. Um, I've not found that broad spectrum multivitamin supplementation helps a whole lot. Um, if people's diets are absolutely terrible, which I would not advise anyone to eat that way, then they might be useful. But I find, look, try to eat the good food. If you don't digest the food well, take an enzyme to help you digest it better and use these herbal and nutritional medicines as medicines, right? Get your baseline support from your diet and from your lifestyle. So that was an important point I wanted to make as well. 
I love what you just said because I just heard this recently and it's like something I knew, but to hear it from somebody actually say it differently, I didn't think of it this way. And that is that most of us are stressed out and we're up in our head all the time. And guess what? If you're up in your head, uh, there's that thing called the gut-brain axis. So you probably might have digestion issues like you're saying. And so we are, we, yeah. we've been talking a lot on this episode about just stress being an overwhelming arc in people's lives. And so it's so funny to hear you say, yeah, that's why I put adaptogens in everything, including the gut supplements, because people aren't digesting their food be- and they need these digestive enzymes because they're so stressed out. They're not making hydrochloric acid. They're not making the, the necessary enzymes to break down this food in the first place. So yeah. how funny it is that really the root cause for a lot of your supplementation is these adaptogens, which I just love. Yeah, it's really, it's so true. Cause when you're in that fight or flight mode, right? It's like, it's like you're a zebra that's running from a lion, right? And, and, and in the natural world, the zebra runs from a lion and it either gets away or it doesn't. And that whole thing is over fairly quickly, right? You know, either the zebra got away and he goes on to, you know, <laughs> eat grass and hang out with his friends and neighbors or, or he's, or he's a meal for a lion. And the whole thing ends quickly. But um, like in our world, it's as if that lion is nipping at our heels all the time. And our, our stress response system, the adrenal glands and all of the hormonal orchestra is just not designed to play that long. It's like the lions nipping at our heels all the time. And depending on where your vulnerability is, it might be digestion, it might be neurocognition, it might be your mood state, it might be your musculoskeletal system, it might be your cardiac. Um, the, that, the, the stress can have different impacts on different people. And that's why adaptogenic herbs, including turmeric, by the way, are really, really important um, across the whole spectrum of, uh, of, of chronic disease. It's so, so, uh, yeah, I can't overemphasize the point. One last question, Dr. Josh, just on supplementation. Do you yeah. see in general, uh, anecdotally or even from studies, um, like some of a loading effect? Because I, I know, especially for adaptogens and stuff, you know, I think I've heard or just anecdotally, like you might need to be doing it for about three months before you really start to see the effects because there's kind of that compound effect where the adaptogens get into your system and get to work. Have you seen that as well? And do you suggest that? I do. Yeah. So these are, it's a long-term play. Some of the adaptogenic herbs can work really quickly. Rhodiola tends to have a pretty quick onset of action. This is another reason why formulation is important, right? Like some things might have a quick earlier onset in golden revive. Plus you see the same thing. Some people get immediate relief after the first couple of doses. Other people, it takes time to build. That's why complex formulas are part of it. But as as far as adaptogens as a group, most of them, not all, but most of them are considered what I call tonics or herbal medicine. People would call tonics, which is different than a medicine that's used acutely for short terms. Tonic herbs are used over the longer term, you know, kind of a daily, um, uh, you know, daily over time. And many of the studies that were done on these herbal medicines, m- much of them in, in Eastern Europe, um, use them exactly that way. For example, people taking uh, eleutherococcus, I mentioned earlier, Siberian ginseng. Imagine two huge button factories. They make buttons in, in Russia or in Siberia, one in one town, one in another town. And it, this is a placebo controlled trial. You give one group a placebo, a little shot of water every time or vodka as they go in. It's Russia, right? Vodka as they go in to work. And the other group gets a shot of eleutherococcus, Siberian ginseng every day. And you just watch what happens over a year. And at the end of that year, what you see is that a daily tonic of eleutherococcus helped them make more buttons better buttons, like the holes were in the center, less time off work for sickness, you know, just an overall general improvement. Not like, oh, I took a taste of eleutherococcus and I feel amazing today. Not like that. More like, wow, I've been taking this for a few months and my overall level of productivity, of immunological resilience, of sleep, of stress management has just improved. And so, yeah, that's the way I think of herbal medicines as a long play, generally. Yeah. Great. I love that. I just, I know I myself and just my listeners, we're all in this world of, we want things to happen right away. And so you have some things that might help with that, but and understand the long-term effect. I, I just wanted to reiterate. I love that. Um, any exciting projects, man? Uh, what's going on for you? You got a book coming out, you got a podcast. What, what is that? Uh, what's new and what can we expect from you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm always busy. Um, the thing that I've been working on that I'm actually really excited about right now, um, is, is, um, in, you know, I make, dry goods, products, right? Supplements. Um, and, but I also create information, um, that I think can help people too. And so we've talked a lot about musculoskeletal pain. So one of the things that, I, that I'm right in the final stages of development right now is, um, a musculoskeletal pain 
project uh, that is about the underlying causes in a body, body system by body system. So neck, shoulders, upper back, low back, knee, hips, ankles, all the body areas, explaining the problems, how they, uh, you know, how they occur, how they arise, and then what to do about them using a protocol um, that, so I don't know if I told you this before, but I'm, I'm a surfer. Like I, I grew up surfing and surfing is like my, my thing. Um, in fact, up wellness, the name of our company is a, is a ocean related term. There's a wave as the logo. I'm a surfer. So, um, the protocol that I designed has four elements in each body area, whether it's your neck or your shoulder, and it's named after my favorite activity, which is surfing. So the, it's called the surf protocol. And what surf stands for is stretching exercises. That's the S unlocking techniques, which are like trigger point release techniques. That's the U unlocking techniques, resistance training, which is strength training. That's the R and then functional movements. So this combination of stretching, unlocking resistance training and functional movements is the surf protocol. And it, applies to every area exercises for the neck, the shoulders, the elbows, the hands, wrists. And, um, I'm really looking forward to releasing that. My team has done a fantastic job of putting this thing together, making it beautiful with pictures and videos. And, um, I really look forward to, um, to getting that out in the world. That's, that's, that's my next big thing. Oh man, I can't wait. That's exciting. Let me know when that drops and, uh, yeah, I can't wait to promote it and and let people know about it. It's going to be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. I'm looking forward to it. It shouldn't be long. Thank you for that. Hey, man, I want to wrap things up in a little bit um, and jump into some final round questions. But any anything I didn't ask you that you wish I had? Oh, gosh, we could go on and on. You're great at this. You make interviewing look really good. And you've asked some astute questions. And um, I really like your observations. I think we covered some good ground here. Dr. Josh, there's always room for uh, a part two with you. So uh, don't worry. We can always have you come back on. And I, I, I know we could we could riff on anything. So um, you have a, anybody that doesn't know, you can just check your bio out. You've got a pretty uh, lengthy um, and in-depth uh, bio. So uh, you know a lot about a lot of things. So we'll definitely have I've been you at it. Well, I've been at it a while, man. I've been I've been. Uh, <laughs> In uh, you know, in the natural medicine space for a really long time, and I've had a, a, a really broad experience with lots of different patients. That's that's where I you know, yes, I learned things in school. Yes, I learned things from my residency, but most of my learnings come from the people that I serve, um, and I've served a lot of people over a lot of years. So yeah, and and I'm not really you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a jack of all right, like a, a, a broad interest, and so I saw people you know as my career developed who had common chronic and complex medical problems for many, many years. And so that gives me, I, I'm grateful to them for, for everything that I know. I love that. How cool is that, that uh, your patients make you better? I think that's just so cool. And it forced mm-hmm. you to get better and develop. I just think that's, that's, uh, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, let's jump into some final round questions. I'm curious, uh, what are some choices or maybe a choice that you think that you made in your life that, that made you who you are today? Wow. Um, many big ones, um, that are seminal moments. Certainly my, you know, on the career side, it is, um, it is my decision to not go the conventional medicine route and go the naturopathic medicine route. That's a decision that I didn't take lightly that nobody in my, on my home team was too terribly excited about because this seemed like a, a weird thing at the time, but that was a decision that I'm very, very grateful for. Um, and then on the personal side, we got to go there too. You know, I married a lovely lady, Amanda. She's my wife. She's a doctor too. She's actually seeing patients right now as we speak. And we have a beautiful family um, and three beautiful children who are successful in their own right. Um, and so that was a damn good call too. <laughs> yeah. You, it, picking your significant other is a huge one. So I, I, yeah. I agree with that one, man. That's, that's huge. Um, obviously, you know, you're such a force in the wellness world. I'm just curious, like who, who inspires you? Is there anybody that you, that inspires you or you follow that that's uh, moving the needle as well? Wow. Another great question. Gosh, there's so many people out there. I think, you know, it's, it's always like, it's the renegades, you know, I think like it's, it's interesting. The people I find myself, um, rather balanced and kind of like, um, uncontroversial in my, in my, at least the way I articulate my views. Yeah. I'm a natural medicine doctor and I practice alternative medicine. There's a lot of people out there that are really pushing the needle with their controversial views and whatnot. And I think those renegades, we need them, right? Like there, there's a, there's a balance there. Um, and there's so many people that have just moved the needle on every subject. I mean, if we look at any, any of the herbal medicines, any of the nutritional medicines, there's always somebody who kind of carried that torch, got deeply invested in vitamin D or deeply invested in and there's so many of them out there too too many to even list yeah 
I'm a big reader. If you were to look over here on the side here, I got a big bookshelf. Are there any books that – is there like a top one or the three books that just had a tremendous impact on your life and you'd say, hey, man, you got to go out and read these because it's gonna, they're going to change your life? Oh, gosh, yeah. I'm a reader too. Um, I'm a nonfiction reader primarily. I'll tell you what's on my bedstand right now, which is Rick Rubin's book on creativity, um, mm. which is not really a health book per se, but um, but I think – doesn't have to really be important. health related you know, at all. Yeah. I mean, just something that changed your, yeah, your mindset. Yeah, absolutely. I tend because health and and wellness, of course, is is and I have a whole big bookshelf there, many many books as well um, that have inspired or, or educated me. But I, I really like to take my reading time to to kind of explore other areas. And so the the two books that I I just finished recently, the autobiography of Flea, the bassist from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, which was really mm-hmm. interesting. Just learning about. I, I'm fascinated by people who are a master of their craft, right? So Flea's an example. Yeah, I'm a fan of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but not any kind of super fan. But that's a person who's really just fully invested and leaned into what he does, which is play the bass in this rock band. Then there's Rick Rubin, who's a music producer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cottage musician myself, and I like music in the creative process. So like, there's a guy who's done music production and done it at the highest levels with the highest level performers. And so just to hear a little bit of insight from people that are masters of their craft, um, I'm endlessly interested. And it doesn't matter the genre. It doesn't matter the industry. Um, I just like to hear from people who do it better or different than anybody else. Agreed. And, and then it's funny, you can take what they did to be disruptive in their industry and bring it into your industry because they're thinking in a way that you wouldn't normally think. So I absolutely. I exactly. That. Yeah. That's what standing on the shoulders of giants is all about. And that's why books are so cool because, you know, people put their all into a book. You know, it's like when they when they're writing that book, like that's a big project for them. So they take their best stuff and they put it in there. So like shout out to books. You know? yeah. Yes. Uh, last two questions. We'll wrap it up. Any rituals or hacks or practices, anything that you do on like on a regular basis? I do. And, 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 and one of them that I think is, 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 is related, but also kind of tangential in a way is, is what I call an awe practice or awesome looking for awesomeness in the, in the world. There was a study that came out of the university of California, Berkeley years ago that demonstrated that the people who experience awe the most frequently, A-W-E, have the lowest levels of interleukin-6, lowest, which is an inflammatory marker. And it's, it's long been known, by the way, that positive emotions, joy, love, contentment, these kinds of things are associated with good health, and negative emotions, anger, jealousy, et cetera, are associated with bad health. But what wasn't known was like which of the positive emotions are most strongly associated with different outcomes. And it turns out that awe, which is wrapped up with gratitude, um, but be, you know, seeing things that are awesome, whether they're technological things or nature things or human things or amazingness in, in, in some kind of way, could be profound or it could be small. Um, experiencing awe more regularly is associated with better health outcomes, most, most notably lower inflammatory responses. And so I make it a practice to look for awesome stuff all the time in people, in tech, in nature, um, in, in, in just the way the world works. And so, uh, in my own family, in my own body. Um, and so that, that's a practice. That's a hack that's free, that works, that just makes your life better in many ways. Yeah. That's so good. I love that. I, yeah. I love that. I had a parenting coach say, you know, look for the good and the good keeps growing or coming. So it's, yeah. it's so true. And I think, I, and I'm using that just with our kids because, you know, we get, I, I get triggered by my kids when they're misbehavior, but 97% of the time or even higher, they're actually really good kids and they're doing the right thing. But because I'm so hyper vigilant on what they're not doing, I miss all the good that they're doing. So I, man, yeah. that, is, that is so good. I love that. I, and I'll, I'll share with you what, something that, that's, that's become part of our family sort of folklore, which is, which is really cool. Is like that I, that I started, which is, which is looking for the good, looking for the awesome for, or for the, for the gratitude and then articulating that to my children. I have three of them and my wife in the form of a weekly email. My kids, I'm guessing, are a little older than yours. I have a 20-year-old, a 19-year-old, and a 17-year-old. And so as they are starting to go out there into the world and do their own things, one way that I can kind of maintain the connection with them is a weekly note that tells them three things that I thought were awesome or that I was grateful for. And some, and there's no obligation for them to write back. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, but what it does for me is two things. And I, I would strongly, I don't know if your kids are young, maybe this is not the now time. I have a 9-year-old and a 5-year-old. 
So this is good. Yeah. So keep this one in your pocket, keep it in your pocket for a while when they're getting a little older and they're, you know, this is more appropriate. You, you, you maintain your connection with them, which is a really cool thing because they're out there in the world and it's cool to just kind of keep tracks, keep tabs on, did this really cool podcast this week with this guy named Joel. It was awesome. Right. Or whatever. And then, um, and it keeps me keeping a little notebook of what awesome things I'm going to put in my weekly email to the kids that week, which is a, a centering thing for me. It's like, Hey, like, Oh, I just had this amazing meal. Is this worthy of my, of my weekly note? I'm not sure. You know, maybe let's like, you know, and then at, you know, on Sunday I put it together and, se- and send it out to them. So that's a practice that, um, yeah, just is, it's just an awesome thing. <laughs> yeah. And it, it furthers the reflection on the eye. It furthers you to be aware and in tune with looking for awe the whole week because you know at the end of the week you got to deliver this message. So I mean, exactly it compounds right. That's on the exactly eye. I love it. it. I love it, brother. Yeah. And yeah. it creates that <laughs> reflection process. You, you've you've devised something uh, in a very cool way. Um, That's a good one. And, yeah. Last but not least, Dr. Joshua Levitt, where can people find you, connect with you, learn more about you and up wellness and all the cool things that you're up to? Okay. Thank you for that. Um, a few places, um, upwellness.com, um, is the place where the, is that's the website where people can see all the products that I've formulated. Um, and that's upwellness.com. A lot of information about the company and all the products are well articulated there. I also do a lot on Instagram. Um, you can join the, I think we're at over 65,000 people I'm told, um, right now on Instagram where I share content, not unlike the content that we talked about here. Uh, it's a great short form, um, just for communicating and engaging with people. And that's at Dr. Josh Levitt on Instagram. And then believe it or not, I'm on TikTok also where we've had a few big hits as well. And that's a fun platform just to kind of keep me dialed into what's current. Um, and we've had a few bangers on TikTok and uh, my TikTok handle is at up wellness. Um, so any or all of the above, I'd love to see, uh, see you there. Awesome. Dr. Joshua Levitt. Thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate you, brother. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This was a treat.